Okay, so this is video number two. Why, where's our Martha? cried Bob Cratchit, looking round. Not coming, said Mrs Cratchit. Not coming, said Bob, with a sudden declension in his high spirits, a kind of reduction in his happiness. For he had been Tim's blood horse all the way from church and had come home rampant. Not coming upon Christmas Day? Martha didn't like to see him disappointed, if it were only a joke. So she came out prematurely from behind the closet door and ran into his arms, while the two young Cratchits hustled Tiny Tim and bore him off into the wash house that he might hear the pudding singing in the copper. And how did little Tim behave, asked Mrs Cratchit, when she had rallied Bob on his credulity, and Bob had hugged his daughter to his heart's content. As good as gold, said Bob, and better. Somehow he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much, and thinks the strangest things you had ever heard. He told me, coming home, that he hoped that people saw him in the church because he was a cripple, and it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day, who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. So Tiny Tim is reminding his dad that of Jesus. You know, that Jesus is this figure who made lame beggars walk and blind men see, and he is glad others will see him because it will remind them of the message of Christmas. Bob's voice was tremulous. I remember it shaking because he's struggling to not cry when he told them this, and trembled more when he said that Tiny Tim was growing strong and hearty. His active little crutch was heard upon the floor, and back came Tiny Tim before another word was spoken, escorted by his brother and sister to his stool before the fire. And while Bob, turning up his cuffs, as if, poor fellow, they were capable of being made more shabby, compounded some hot mixture in a jug with gin and lemons and stirred it round and round and put it on the hob to simmer, Master Peter and the two ubiquitous young Cratchits, this means they're everywhere, ubiquitous things are all over the place, ubiquitous young Cratchits went to fetch the goose, with which they soon returned in high procession. Such a bustle! ensued and it followed that you might have thought a goose the rarest of all birds a feathered phenomenon to which a black swan was a matter of course and in truth it was something very like that in that house that is the rarest most expensive bird of all but it's not it's cheap at this time mrs cratchit made the gravy ready beforehand in a little saucepan hissing hot master peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigor miss belinda sweetened up the apple sauce martha dusted the hot place bob took tiny tim beside him in a tiny corner at the table the two young cratchits set chairs for everybody not forgetting themselves and mounting guard upon their posts crammed spoons into their mouths lest they should shriek for goose before their turn came to be helped at last the dishes were set on and grace was said. It was succeeded by a breathless pause as Mrs Cratchit, looking slowly all along the carving knife, prepared to plunge it in the breast. But when she did, and when the long-expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight arose all around the board, and even Tiny Tim, excited by the two young Cratchits, beat on the table with the handle of his knife and feebly cried, Hurrah! There never was such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe there ever was such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavour, size and cheapness were the themes of universal admiration. Eked out by apple sauce and mashed potatoes. It's kind of made bigger, it's made to go further. It was a sufficient dinner for the whole family. Indeed, as Mrs Cratchit said with great delight, surveying one small atom of a bone upon the dish, they hadn't ate it all at last. Yet everyone had had enough, and the youngest Cratchits in particular were steeped in sage and onion to the eyebrows. But now, the plates being changed by Miss Belinda, Mrs Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to bear witness, to take the pudding up and bring it in. Suppose it should not be done enough. Suppose it should break in turning out. There's worries here about whether the Christmas pudding's going to have worked. Suppose somebody should have got over the wall of the back garden and stolen it while they were merry with the goose, a supposition at which the two young Cratchits became livid. All sorts of horrors were supposed. Hello, a great deal of steam. The pudding was out of the copper. A smell like a washing day. That was the cloth. A smell like an eating house and a pastry cook's next door to each other with a lawn dresses next door to that. That was the pudding. 
In half a minute, Mrs. Cratchit entered, flushed but smiling proudly with the pudding, like a speckled cannonball, so hard and firm, blazing in half and half a quarter of ignited brandy and bedight with Christmas holly stuck into the top. Oh, a wonderful pudding, Bob Cratchit said, and calmly too, that he regarded it as the greatest success achieved by Mrs. Cratchit since their marriage. Mrs. Cratchit said that now the weight was off her mind. She would confess she had had her doubts about the quantity of flour. Everybody had something to say about it, but nobody said or thought it was at all a small pudding for a large family. It would have been a flat heresy to do so, something almost uh, like a violation of something sacred. Any Cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing. And it's worth stressing that Christmas pudding is obviously not something we have in Italy here, but it's a kind of traditional thing that we eat in England. A kind of ugly, horrible-looking thing with lots of raisins and like candida in it, like candied fruit. But it's such a big deal for the Cratchits because it's cooked in the kind of communal ovens. And, it's, and they're not sure whether it's going to have even worked because it, it, often you leave it for a long time. So it's a bit of a miracle that they've managed to pull it off. <laughs>